This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's episode of Crimes and Consequences. How are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? I feel like shit, and you know this. I do know this. (laughs) But thanks for asking. I have allergies really bad, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. I care. Except you. Before I share this story, I just want to ask anybody that hasn't done so to go ahead and hit the follow or subscribe button. It really helps. And also, this week's promo at the end of our episode is for our true crime podcast so everybody stick around and listen to that promo and in addition one more thing usually we do this at the end of our episode but today i wanted to give shout outs to our patreon members thank you Kristen w gabrielle d carrie m rob m Royzen c jessica m rebecca h i'm calling her compton b and dsc and kim c Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. That being said, no more chit-chatting. No more chit-chatting. Let's get to the story. I hate chit-chatting on true crime podcasts. Seriously, I listen to some, and I'm like, just shut the hell up. (laughs) Tell me me what happened. Get to the story. So I'm going to shut us up. Let's do this. Let's do it. Are you ready? Absolutely. Okay, so from May 1979 until November of 1984, there were six unsolved throat-slashing killings in the San Diego area. A seventh victim named Jody Santiago Robertson, she survived her throat-slashing injuries. And in December of 1984, she was able to identify her attacker. So let's do this. Absolutely. On May 4th in 1979, Michael and Suzanne Jacobs lived in this small, white-framed house in the eastern end of San Diego, California. They lived there with their three-year-old son, Colin, and their two dogs. On May 4th, Michael and Suzanne, they were expecting a delivery of a new dinette set. Michael woke up early that morning and he went about his normal workday routine. He left the house at around 6 a.m. and he drove away in the family car. The family had one other car. It was a blue off-road Volkswagen Beetle and they cut the top off and outfitted it with a roll bar. So I don't know what they were going. They had an off-road VW Beetle? (laughs) Yes. I don't know, (laughs) but it's off-road. Margaret Harris, now she was the neighbor, and she was also Suzanne's friend. She lived across the street from the Jacobs house. That morning, she didn't see Suzanne outside her house as she usually was, because usually Suzanne liked to garden in the morning while Colin rode his tricycle around the driveway. Instead, Margaret saw a maroon or wine-colored sports car with a black top Part in the Jacobs driveway. And it was between about 8.30 and 9 a.m. Later that morning, at around 11 a.m., Margaret telephoned Suzanne, but no one answered. She assumed that Suzanne had been picked up by whoever was in that little sports car. A little after that, Michael telephoned Suzanne from work. He just wanted to check on her, but he got no answer. At approximately 12.30 p.m., a delivery man arrived at the Jacobs residence to deliver that dinette shipment I told you about. He knocked on the door and he waited for about 10 minutes for someone to answer. He could hear the dogs barking in the back. Margaret Harris, the neighbor, she peeked out of her window and she saw the delivery man there with the dinette furniture on the front porch. This surprised her because she knew Suzanne was expecting that delivery and didn't understand why Suzanne wasn't answering the door. Eventually, the delivery guy just left the dinette set outside. When Michael returned home from work at about five, he was immediately puzzled when he saw, obviously, the dinette furniture on their front porch. I mean, Suzanne was supposed to be home to make sure that the shipment got put inside the house. 
He entered the house and the first thing he noticed was blood all over the bathroom. So I'm thinking the bathroom must be very close to the entryway. As he backed out of the bathroom, he saw three-year-old Colin laying dead on the bedroom floor. Oh. Should have warned you that children are involved in this. Michael ran out of the house and went across the street to Margaret and her husband, Ed. They happened to be outside. He was described as being in a state of shock. He couldn't talk, and eventually he just collapsed on the ground. The Harrises went in to the Jacobs house to see what was going on. They discovered Colin's body just inside the entrance of the master bedroom, and Suzanne's body was further inside the master bedroom. Margaret Harris then called the police. Emergency units and the San Diego police officers arrived at the Jacobs residence and they secured the crime scene. There was a significant amount of blood on the bathroom floor and on the hallway leading to the bedroom. There was blood on the front and inside of the bathtub. On the bathroom rug was this folded, torn scrap of paper and when they opened it up the words love insurance were written along with the number 280-1700. Now love insurance is actually the name of an insurance firm in San Diego. That's cute. I guess. I guess. And the number 280-1700 was the firm's telephone number. The note had a blood stain on it. Child-sized, bloody footprints left the bathroom and were all the way to the inside of the master bedroom where Colin's body was found. Colin's throat had been severely slashed. Because the amount of blood found in the bathroom, the child-sized, bloody footprints leading from it, and the amount of blood on the front of Colin's clothing... Detectives believe Colin's throat had been cut in the bathroom, but he had survived long enough to walk down the hallway where he collapsed on the bedroom floor. Oh, that poor baby. I know, it's so sad. The master bedroom showed signs of a violent struggle. A pad railing had been dislodged from the edge of the waterbed. The bed sheets were out of place and blood stained. There was a smear of blood on top of the dresser drawers, and some of the items from the dresser had fallen onto the floor. Next to the entrance of the master bedroom, there was a smear of blood on the light switch and also on the door adjacent to it. Suzanne's fully clothed body lay sprawled on the floor between the waterbed and the dressers. In both of her hands, there were several strands of blonde hair. She had bruising across her back near her bra strap and her shirt had been torn. Suzanne's throat, like Collins, had been slashed from ear to ear. Because of the sheer volume of blood on the floor of the master bedroom, no one could have walked around the bodies without leaving footprints. I mean, it was just a horrific scene. They found adult-sized bloody footprints with a distinctive Vibram sole pattern. Do you know what that is? No. Vibram is a type of work boot, and it's got its own specific soul pattern. The footprints led out of the bedroom toward the dining room and then into the kitchen. In front of the kitchen sink, the footprints overlapped as if someone had stepped there repeatedly. There was blood on the kitchen sink, on the faucet, on the drain trap. There was blood on a washcloth in the sink, in the soap holder, and a green paper towel left on the kitchen counter. Obviously, the assailant had used the sink to wash. And this is going to get graphic because I'm going to talk about the autopsy. But I did cut a lot of the autopsy out. According to the pathologist, Colin's throat had been slashed with at least two distinct cuts. And he was basically almost decapitated. Oh, really? He bled to death. He had severe cuts on the tips of his two fingers, on his right thumb, on the palm of his left hand, and also on his thumb of his left hand. Suzanne's throat had been slashed at least six distinct times, and there was a gaping wound. Again, she was almost decapitated. 
Like Colin, Suzanne died of blood loss. However, Suzanne had evidence of petechial hemorrhaging, the tiny specks of blood caused by the rupture of the capillary blood vessels. She had that in her left eye. In addition, she died with her tongue clenched between her teeth. So she was strangled, too. Oddly, though, she wasn't raped. But this is where it's really weird. So she hadn't been seen in the morning, right? Her blood alcohol level at death was 0.04%, which would be consistent with her having consumed two 8-ounce glasses of wine within the hour she died. And friends said that Suzanne didn't ordinarily drink in the morning. In the living room, the television had been left on, and on top of it was a glass of red wine. There was also an ashtray containing a cigarette butt. At the time of her death, Suzanne Jacobs had matches and a Winston brand package of cigarettes in her pant pockets. But the cigarette in the ashtray was Marlboro. Around the television was more bloody footprints with the same vibrant sole pattern. The police were able to get a fingerprint off of the love note, the love insurance note, The only problem is they applied something called nehydrin. That's how they were able to discover it. And no one realized that nehydrin makes a fingerprint fade. And they never bothered to take a picture of it. Are you kidding me? So they made a mistake. But there was once a fingerprint on there. (laughs) They just never recorded it. They just, yep, never got recorded. So this case went cold. And it's really tragic because it's very violent and odd. A year after the Jacobs murder, in August of 1980, a guy named Shorty Smith from Kentucky, he met a man named John Mason Gale at an Arizona gas station. According to Shorty Smith, he offered Mason Gale a ride to a mine in California. They were going to do some work. During the ride, Shorty claims that John Mason Gale said he was wanted in California for murder, but he didn't take him seriously. On John was a a four-and-a-half-inch buck knife. When they got to the California mine, it was closed, so they decided to drive to Los Angeles, and along the way, they picked up a second hitchhiker named Jimmy Nelson. During the drive to Los Angeles, John talked a lot and bragged about cutting off someone's head. Oh. He said, if a woman treats you badly, quote, you just cut their head off and get it over with, end quote. John was described as having a dual personality and that he could shift from being the nicest person to one of the most violent people in the world. When John, Shorty, and Jimmy arrived to Los Angeles, they went to a gay bar in Hollywood. Although John was this handsome, flashy dresser who portrayed himself as a ladies' man, he was actually turning tricks for money in the gay bar. And then when he got back after doing whatever he did outside of the bar, he would share the money with his friends. Apparently, he enjoyed ingesting windowpane LSD. Do you know what that is? (laughs) Do I look like I know what that is? I don't know what that is either. But... It's a type of LSD, right? I guess. I guess. guess. And again, he started bragging about murdering a woman and also her son. He said that he met a woman named Sue Ann. And then another time he called her Ann in San Diego and he went to her house. He explained that they had a couple drinks at the home and they were sitting in the living room making out. But her little boy interrupted them. He said he needed to go to the bathroom. When... The boy refused to go to the bathroom by himself. Apparently, John said that the mom got up to help, and that really pissed him off. And he grabbed the bitch by the hair, worked on slicing her throat, and then worked on the little boy so he'd never have to go to the bathroom again. That's what he told his friends. The next day, John decided to stay in Los Angeles while his friends Jimmy and Shorty moved on. John gave Jimmy some of his clothes, a pair of boots, and some other items, including a striped brown and white silk shirt that appeared to have blood on it. Soon after Jimmy left Los Angeles, he became a suspect in Texas for murder. He was arrested 
And he started squealing on all these murders he knew about. Wow, he knows a lot of murders? Apparently. (laughs) He told the authorities about the Jacobs killings. He told them he knew a man named Johnny. He confessed to knife slashing the throats of a woman and her child in San Diego. And he also told them about a blue Volkswagen bug being at the Jacobs house. Jimmy told them, hey, I've got some of the clothes that John gave me still. They're at my house. And the police went to his house and they did retrieve some of the clothing. And they sent that off to San Diego police to help figure out and solve the Jacobs case. That's according to the Texas authorities, because he was helping uh, authorities in Texas and Alabama, actually. When the San Diego police opened the package, there was no bloody shirt. So no one knows what happened to this quote-unquote bloody shirt. Years went by, and the police could not find John Massingale. During this time, similar murders occurred in the San Diego area. There were five more attacks that resulted in four more murders. But one, as I told you in the beginning, survived. The uniqueness of the throat wounds of the victims was really evident to the police. Detectives compared more than three dozen homicide cases involving throat wounds in the previous 20 years in that area, and none of the cases resembled these particular crimes. The slashing of the throat was so unique that detectives realized that these five attacks had to be committed by the same people, and they had to be related to the Jacob's death. And I'm going to get into these attacks in a minute. But I want to let you know, they found John Massingale in March of 1984 in Kentucky. He was well known to local authorities as being a liar and like a petty thief. They interviewed John, and he admitted he'd been in San Diego in the early summer of 1979, but he denied any involvement in the Jacobs murder. At first, that is, at first. During a second interview, John changed his story and confessed. He said he met Sue Ann in a bar, but he couldn't remember how he got to her house. He told the police that he recalled sitting on her couch. He pinched her leg, but she smacked him in the face. And then he just went crazy because he was high in LSD. He got up off the couch and she told him to get out, get the fuck out of my house. The little boy yelled out, don't hit my mommy. And he remembered cutting both of them with a knife that he had holstered on his belt. He remembered cutting Colin in the bathroom and washing up in the kitchen sink and even the dogs barking. After he killed them, he went to the Salvation Army Mission, which is like a homeless shelter, and he spent a few nights there. They gave him some new clothes, and he claims he buried the knife in a Mexican desert. He also said that he did give Jimmy some of his clothes. John said he was really sorry that he'd never killed anyone before, and he would never hurt a child, but... The LSD made him nervous and, quote, plumb out of his mind. So don't take LSD. (laughs) The following day, he was arrested and transported to San Diego, where he remained in jail through December of 1984, awaiting trial for the Jacob's death. Just give you a little bit of background on John. Not going to go into a lot, but there's a point to it. John grew up in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky. He could not read and he could not spell. He was illiterate. He worked as a painter and a coal miner, but he spent most of his time as a drifter and, quote, day laborer. And as I said, he would stay at Salvation Army missions around the United States and just kind of traveled around. He was described as a transient, but he liked to dress really nice. While he was awaiting trial for the Jacobs murder, the police continued to investigate the unsolved murders that had occurred since the Jacob killings. They were expecting to be able to connect them all to John. But as you will soon see, that didn't happen. Really? Things aren't always what they seem. I'm going to take a quick break, okay? Hey, everyone. If you go to our website, tntcrimes.com, you can find full unreleased episodes available for individual purchase. 
You can also join our membership where you get unlimited access to all of our unreleased episodes, early releases, mini episodes, and so many other awesome things. So go to TNTCrimes.com. And thanks again for all your support. So we're back, and I'm going to tell you about the other killings. Two years after the Jacobs death in 1981, Annette Goff owned a house in Spring Valley near San Diego with her boyfriend, William Green. The relationship between Annette and William had deteriorated, creating this huge amount of animosity between them. Annette had actually obtained a restraining order against William that kept him out of the house, and she filed a civil suit against him in a property dispute. Due to their estrangement, Annette decided to sell the house, and she hired her friend Gail Garcia, who was a real estate agent, to sell the house. On December 8th in 1981, Gail went to the home. She was there sometime between 4 and 6 because she had a prospective client that wanted to see the house after she placed an ad listing for a property to rent to own. Now, William, he still had a key to the house, and he wanted to show the property to his friend that evening, but Annette refused to let him. Over several phone calls, Annette and William argued about allowing William's friend to see the property, and Annette eventually hung up on William. She called Gail at 5.35 to let her know that she would be over at the house in about 20 minutes and that William might be coming over too. Annette got to the house at 6.05, and she went there with her brother, Chris. When they got there, the front door was open and the phone was ringing as they entered the house. When Chris answered the phone, it was William on the other line, and he asked if Gail, the realtor, was still there. Annette took the phone and Chris began walking around the house looking for Gail. He discovered Gail's body lying on the floor of a dark bedroom. When investigators arrived, they found Gail's body on top of a vacuum cleaner tube. You know, the suction hose. Yes, thank you. A broken fingernail of Gail's was found in the hallway just outside the bedroom. And all of the blood was actually just under Gail's body or right by her body. Her pants had two parallel smears running down them that were from a bloody knife blade being white. An autopsy was done on Gail the next day. Her body had a large, gaping wound extending from the angle of the jaw on the left side, that's what the court paper said, all the way across her neck to the angle of the jaw on the right side, whatever that (laughs) means exactly. She too was almost decapitated and ultimately bled to death. There were small, fine, petechial hemorrhages found in both of her eyes, very similar to Suzanne's, and she had been choked, but she died from bleeding. So that crime went unsolved. Three years after Gail's murder, 34-year-old Jody Robertson, she came down from Seattle, Washington to visit her brother in San Diego. First night she was there, she went out with her brother to a bar, but she met a lovely man. His name was Neil. She decided to go home with Neil, and later the next morning, you get what I'm saying, (laughs) She came back to her brother's house. Later that night, she decided to go to a club alone. I guess she liked to have a good time. Good for her. (laughs) I have never been to a club alone, but that's okay. I know. It's kind of scary out there. That's the point. It's kind of scary. At around 1030, she decided to leave the club and walk back to her brother's apartment. As Jody passed the apartment complex's parking lot, a man came up behind her. He placed a knife at her throat. And he told her if she ran or she screamed, he was going to slice her throat. He led her to his dark brown Datsun 280ZX. The car was already running and the driver's side door was already open. Jody was forced through the driver's side door and she became seated partially in the center console area and then partially on the passenger seat. The seats had sheepskin seat covers. Isn't that lovely? (laughs) Her kidnapper placed the knife in front of him on the dashboard behind the steering wheel. 
And then he drove the vehicle with his left hand on the steering wheel while he kept his right hand wrapped around Jody's shoulder and neck. During the drive, Jody noticed that the driver had a mustache, he had blonde hair, and bulging blue eyes. The car drove up to a house with this semicircular driveway. Jody was led out of the car and up some stairs to the front door. She was taken to a bedroom with boxes where her hands were tied behind her. She was then taken to another bedroom and placed on a bed. When Jody tried to lift up her head to cough, the man began choking her until she lost consciousness. And Jody doesn't remember anything that happened after that point. The following morning, around 6.40 a.m., two women on a morning walk discovered Jody lying in the brush and weeds on the side of the road. At this residential intersection, she was naked below the waist, had blood all over her face. Jody was moaning and making these gurgling sounds. There were severe cuts across the front of her neck and also really deep cuts to her fingers. There was blood on the side of the road and on the weeds, which suggested that she'd actually been cut where she was found. Jody was taken to the hospital and she wasn't expected to survive because she was about as close to being decapitated as you could be and be alive. These surgeons examined her neck wounds and they found that her larynx was cut. The cuts to her neck were so deep that they actually reached her vertebrae. And I could go into jugular veins and carotid arteries and I didn't know the difference between right external jugular veins and internal jugular veins, but I'm not going to do all that. (laughs) I'm not going to do all that. The wounds were consistent with a sawing or a carving type motion. They also found below the cut ligature marks. There were signs that Jody had had sex, but they didn't know if it was from her fun night with Neil or she'd been raped. In addition, Jody had a severe skull fracture on the back of her head, extending from ear to ear. Her skin had been split open all over her head. You could see the tendons in some of her bones on her fingers and hands. She had to have reconstructive surgery to her neck, but she was actually able to leave the hospital 18 days later. That's amazing. She had a really long road to recovery, mostly because of the massive beating she took to the skull. It impaired her memory for a long time. She suffered PTSD, as you can imagine, and was suicidal for a while. And that case went unsolved, but they just had a lot of problems because Jody couldn't offer them any information. Now, four months after the attack on Jody, another attack occurred. In October of 1984, Rhonda Strang was 24 years old. She was married to a guy named Robert Strang, and they had a baby named Jessica. Rhonda also had a five-year-old daughter named April. Robert is not what you would call a good husband. Oh, no. He used marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine. He beat Rhonda frequently, and he stole drugs, which really upset Rhonda. He even sold drugs to her own brother, Richard, And Richard began bringing people over to his house to buy drugs. Richard brought his boss, David Lucas, to his house to buy drugs. And this place was becoming this massive, like, drug home. All of this freaked Rhonda out. She was so afraid that Robert's drug activity, and in particular one of his suppliers, was going to kill her. Because they were really shady and really dangerous. Rhonda became very conscious about security at her home and would compulsively keep the doors and windows locked. She always checked to see who was at the door before opening it. She considered divorcing Robert, which is a very good idea. And in contemplation of the divorce, she kept a diary of the drug transactions. She confided in people that she was almost certain her house was being watched. She began cooperating with San Diego police and offered them information regarding Robert's supplier. She told a lot of her friends she was covertly tracking Robert's activities by keeping a diary, tapes of phone conversations, and a list of drug dealers and their drug deals. Girls, a one-woman detective agency. 
Well, she's getting ready for divorce, and you and I both know that's true. She's cover her ass. She kept telling people that she was afraid she was going to be murdered because she just knew too much about the whole narcotics activity scene. On the morning of October 23rd, Robert Strang arrived for work at 8. Apparently he had a job, which is good, besides selling drugs. <laughs> and he remained there until about 3.30. Robert's foreman regularly took special note of Robert's presence at work because Robert had a reputation for sneaking off the job site without permission. Surprise. About an hour after he left, between 9 and 9.30, a man named Gregory Fisher, he was Rhonda's friend, he came over to the house and he brought his three-year-old daughter Amber there. And he asked Rhonda if she wouldn't mind babysitting her because he had to go to work and he didn't have a babysitter. And Rhonda said, okay. Later on that day, Rhonda's five-year-old daughter April came home from kindergarten. She walked by herself she got home about 1.30, and when she opened the door, she found a horrific scene no five-year-old should ever see. April ran to the neighbor's home, and 911 was called. Firefighters actually came first, and when they got there, they found the murder bodies of Rhonda and three-year-old Amber. However, baby Jessica was inside her playpen unharmed. When they examined the crime scene, they didn't find any signs of any forced entry, All the doors to the house were locked except the door between the kitchen and the locked garage. Rhonda was laying on her back on the living room floor and her throat had been cut from ear to ear and she was almost decapitated. Next to her was little Amber's body and her throat had been cut and she had almost been decapitated too. Who could do this to little kids? I don't. I was going to say I don't know, but I do. But you do. I do. I know, but it takes a special kind of sick. It's so fucked up, Tanya. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I can tell you that Rhonda's neck had at least five distinct cutting strokes. And she had been strangled with her gold necklace. Little Amber had defensive wounds and the tip of her fingers had been cut off from trying to save her life. But what's interesting is that the investigators looked for Rhonda's diary, cassette tapes, and all that drug activity she said she'd written down, and they never found any of it. Really? That's bizarre. It is bizarre. Now, less than a month later... After Amber and Rhonda's murder, on the evening of November 19th, and this is 1984 still, 22-year-old Anne Swink was visiting her boyfriend Gregory near the San Diego State University campus. Anne went to the University of San Diego, by the way. She was a student. She left Gregory's apartment at like 1230 in the morning, and she mentioned to him before she left that her Dodge Colt was low on gas. That same night, a woman named Gail Graham was working as an employee at a gas station, and she encountered Anne. Anne walked in with a gas can and purchased some gasoline. Gail saw Anne leave the gas station on foot and assumed that she would be walking to her car somewhere on the side of the road that ran out of gas. Soon after that, a man named Richard was driving home, and he was stopped at this traffic light. While he was there, he saw a car parked at the side of a road, and he saw someone bent over at the rear of the car as if they were pouring gasoline in the gas tank. He looked away for just a moment, and when he looked back, he saw another vehicle was parked by the first one. As Richard made his turn, he passed the vehicles, and he noticed the silhouettes of two people who appeared to be embracing. It did occur to him briefly that it could be a kidnapping, but he decided it wasn't, and he moved on. The next morning, police got a report about an abandoned Dodge Colt on the side of the road. When they arrived, they found Ann Swink's wallet on the passenger seat. On the driver's side rear corner of the trunk lid were Ann's car keys, her flashlight, and a gas tank cap. The gas tank flap was open, and the gas can was on the ground by it. Five days after her disappearance, a guy named James McNally was walking in the woods near his home. 
and he came across Anne's body in a rough, rocky, steep, remote area, and he called the police. Police found Anne laying face down in the mud near the bottom of this rocky hill. She was nude from the waist down, except for her socks. Around her neck was a silver choke chain, like the ones you use for dogs. You know, the big, the leashes. Right. When they rolled her body over, they noticed a huge gaping hole in her throat from where it had been cut. And she, again, like all the others, was almost decapitated. Her clothes were found near her body. Her shirt, bra, and sweater vest had been sliced through the middle. Her pants were just a few feet away, and they were still zipped and buttoned, but they had been sliced along the zipper all the way down the crotch area. Her shoes were scattered further up the hill, and her underwear were found further up the hill, too. They could tell as soon as they got there that Anne had been there for days. An autopsy was done on Anne. As I said, she'd almost been decapitated. There were seven, at the minimum, distinct, separate, sawing-type cuts on the left side of her neck that went all the way to the right, and then at least four more that started on the right and went to the left for a total of 11 cuts. In addition... The discoloration and marks on Anne's neck were consistent with a dog chain having been pulled tightly in an upward direction. Anne had an injury to her tongue that suggested she had bitten it while she was being choked with the dog choker. Her body had scrapes primarily on her butt and thighs as if she'd been dragged across the ground over really rough terrain. Genital swabs were taken, but there was no semen. And if you notice, I haven't really been talking about any rapes, which is unusual for Mm -hmm. a sicko like this, right? Especially if they have no pants on. Right. The victims had no pants on, and I don't understand. I don't understand either. I mean, I'm (laughs) glad she wasn't put through that, but it just seems weird. We tell these sick stories all the time. And and this is just odd not to have it even sicker than it's already. (laughs) Right. Under Anne's fingernails, they found blood and skin, so they clipped them. Literally right after Anne's murder, Jody, remember Jody Robertson, she came back to San Diego from Seattle, Washington to help the investigators. Her memory was getting better, and the police really believed that Anne Swank's murder, whoever did that to her, is the one that attacked Jody. Well, that's really brave of her. Yeah, it is. The police did a photo array with images of potential suspects that match Jody's description, especially men with bulging eyes. And Jody was eventually able to identify her attacker. His name was David Allen Lucas. That same afternoon, the detectives took Jody to David's neighborhood to see if she would recognize his house. And she did. It had a semicircle driveway. She was actually able to also do a sketch for the police of the inside of his house. And when the police went inside David Allen Lucas's house, it matched her sketch. David had owned a Datsun 280ZX, which he sold three days after Jody's attack. Police were able to track the car that he sold down and Jody identified it. And everybody said that he had sheepskin seat covers. So David was arrested and police began trying to connect him to the other murders, including the Jacob murders, for which John, let's not forget John Massengale, is being tried for. And by the way, he's in death. I'm going to tell you just a brief itty bitty bit about asshole David. David was born in the Philippines. His father was stationed there in the Navy. He was a bedwetter. Uh, they're number one. Ding! <laughs> Check. His father was abusive. One time, his dad actually forced his sister to eat a salad. She vomited up. David had a history of drug and alcohol abuse. He was often unemployed and homeless. Sometimes he would stay at the Salvation Army Mission, the homeless shelter. Or at some point, he started a carpet cleaning company with his friend Frank. It's pretty scary to think that 
this guy come in and clean your carpet. He eventually married his longtime girlfriend, Shannon, and they had two kids and two dogs. Of course, he beat Shannon. Of course. He was arrested for drunk driving. And in fact, he was supposed to do a two-day sentence for that drunk driving on October 24th, and he didn't show up. And that would be the day after Rhonda and Amber were murdered. He didn't show up. He was busy, Talia. He was busy. In 1973, he was convicted of rape. This victim we'll call Jane. She cleaned the house of a friend of his. He showed up at her house with some of his friends, and they started partying. She was partying with another friend, Alejandrina. So it's Jane, Alejandrina, David, and some of his friends at her house on May 27th, 1973. At around 9 p.m., Jane asked everybody to leave. Alejandrina called her an hour later to make sure that the men had left because Alejandrina had left. And Jane said, yeah, they're all gone. However, later, David came back and held a knife to her and he forced her into his car, drove away and raped her, but then returned her home. She reported the crime and he was convicted, but he must have not have done that long because he was out less than six years later killing the Jacobs. So I'm not going to go through all the evidence against David because there's so much, there's so many crimes. Let me just tell you, he's a bad dude. They interviewed his wife, Shannon, and Shannon told them that she and David had two dogs. When investigators showed her the dog chain used to choke Ann, Shannon gasped, saying that that was her dog, Duke's chain, and the chain had gone missing, and she was visibly upset. After speaking with coworkers and friends, the police were able to piece together David's whereabouts on the night of Ann's murder. He'd spent part of the evening with his business partner, Frank. They did some crystal meth. They drank some beer and they watched Fatal Attraction. <laughs> he left Frank's house around the same time Anne was abducted. The next morning, though, David called Frank and he said he needed to take a week off of work. He explained to Frank that after leaving his house, he went to the bar and he got into a fight. He claimed a beer mug had smashed into his face. And he wouldn't be able to go to work for at least a week. So that means Ann kicked his ass. In addition, a person that was running a room from David noticed that David had deep facial scratches. They were four inches long, starting in his eyelid and went all the way down his cheek. And it took a month for these scratches to heal. Genetic markers found underneath Ann's fingernails matched David's blood type. So David's now being charged with the abduction and attempted murder of Jody. While he's incarcerated on those charges, he's forced to provide a handwriting sample. This is compared to the handwriting on the love insurance note, and it's found to be a match. So the question is, how the hell does Joe Massengale fit into this picture? He I, knew all this information, Tanya. I've been wondering. What did I tell you? I mean, remember, he confessed to details. Investigators were able to show that at the time John Massengale was staying at the Salvation Army mission at the time of the Jacobs murder, so was David. They believe that the two were both probably doped up on drugs and that David actually confessed all the details of the murder to John, who, for some stupid reason, went around bragging to people that he's the one that did it. David smoked Marlboro cigarettes, which were found in the ashtray. His mom owned a wine-colored sports car. And it's believed that David probably bumped into Suzanne at a bar at some point because she did like to go to the bar, but she didn't drink in the morning. There's a whole bunch of other little loose ends that connect him. But we'd be here all day. So John didn't do it at all? No. He was just high and heard the story and just decided to act like he did it. Exactly. And then in the interviews with the police, they would reveal some of the information. And then he would pick that up when they were talking and add it to his story. Oh, that's a creepy thing to do. David Allen Lucas goes on trial for all those murders and the kidnappings. But he's not found guilty of all of them. The jury actually acquitted him of the realtor 
Gail Garcia's murder, they acquitted him. There was a hung jury for Rhonda Strang and little Amber Fisher. The vote was 11 to 1 in favor of his guilt, but it has to be unanimous. However, he was found guilty of the Jacobs murder, of Jody's kidnapping and attempted murder, and the murder of Anne Swank, and he was sentenced to death. Which he deserved. Well, that's, you know, up to you and how you feel about the <laughs> death penalty. Was he put to death? No, he's still alive. He's still there on uh, death row. Of course he is. In San Quentin. Of course he is. San Quentin must just be, I know we've said this before, it must be wild. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't imagine. Wild? I can't, I can't I imagine just, working there. Die. I can't even say the words without shaking. I, I, I can't imagine working there as a correctional officer. No. They must, they must have some fucked up shit to say. That's all I had to say. <laughs> I can't even imagine. So that is the story of, I think he's the serial killer, right? He yep. counts as a serial killer. Serial killer David Allen Lucas. Well, thanks for that, Talia. You're welcome. And everyone, don't forget to subscribe or follow. Absolutely. On whatever app you're listening to us on now. And don't forget to listen to the promo we have at the end of our music for our true crime podcast. In addition, if you want to get more episodes like this, we have a whole bunch exclusive online only episodes. You can go to our website, tntcrimes.com, or you can become a member and help support us by going to patreon.com slash tntcrimes. Also, check out our social media at Instagram. It's TNT Crimes Podcast. At Facebook, it's TNT Crimes Podcast. Anything else? You've covered it all, Talia. All right. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Don't kill each other. <laughs> Please For real. Don't. I mean, seriously, don't. Until next time. Bye. Bye. This is Edward October. It's Sunday morning, and I'm here at a typical American home. But inside, Jen and Cam of our true crime podcast sit down to record their latest episode. Though Jen and Cam are lifelong friends, they approach true crime with the utmost professionalism. They're focused. So, 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 what are your... Highly articulate. Alachua, is that how you say it? Um, Um, Alachua, like Joshua, but Alachua. Alachua. (laughs) You will Alachua onto my... And above all, compassionate. Honestly, I debated if I wanted to do this. And in the end, I decided it was important to honor this baby's short life. Every day, more folks wake up hungry for a true crime podcast. And our true crime podcast is enjoyed best by more people. So whenever you're downloading any podcast of any kind, be sure to download an extra episode of our true crime podcast. You like them. Available on all your favorite podcatchers or at our truecrimepodcast.com. See this? The mouth, it gets me in trouble.